Good afternoon and welcome to the ISIP South Africa chapter webinar in conjunction with ITTC and the SAMRC. Um, and the title of the webinar today is the Global Adult Tobacco Survey SA Implementation Results. And our second portion of the webinar will be tomorrow from 3 p.m. South African time, and that will be talking about the implications for policy of the Global Adult Tobacco Survey. Um, uh, as uh, <clears throat> A member of ISIP South Africa, I'd just like to welcome all of our attendees. It's great to have you with us. Um, and just some housekeeping. If you do have a question during the webinar presentation, please feel free to post your questions in the questions box on the panel. Um, uh, on the uh, go to webinar panel, you will see a little section there called questions. Um, so any attendees, if you do have any questions, please post them there. The webinar today will run from uh, now 12.30 until about um, 2 p.m. Uh, and we have two speakers with us who will be introduced shortly by my colleague, Professor Goodman Sebeko from RTTC South Africa. Thank you for joining us. And Professor Sebeko, over to you. Thank you very much, Roger. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, this webinar is being hosted within um, the lecture slot of the Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health at University of Cape Town. So welcome to my colleagues from the department. It is hosted by the Division of Addiction Psychiatry through its um, International Technology Transfer Center South Africa, which is funded by US Department of State. Uh, in collaboration with ISAP Global and ISAP South Africa. So we thank ISAP Global for their support um, and ISAP South Africa for the ongoing um, collaboration, which really seeks to strengthen the workforce in addiction. We're also very grateful to our, for our partnership with uh, SAMRC, so the South African Medical Research Council. There's so much we do with them. Um, and so it's, it's really a family gathering here today. And we're really excited to hear the processes, um, outcomes, and implications of um, the survey. So coming up first will be uh, Dr. Sebenzile Ngosi. She's a senior scientist um, at the SAMRC's Alcohol, Tobacco, and Other Drug Research Unit. She holds a, res holds a research associate position at Rhodes University and has a PhD from University of South Africa. Her works uh, largely focused on men and masculinity within various cross-cutting contexts, including substance use, mental health, violence, and HIV. And she also serves as the project manager for the GATT South Africa. So she's going to talk to us about the GATT implementation process. So I mentioned that this uh, presentation is being held within the auspices of the lecture series with, uh, within the Department of uh, Psychiatry and Mental Health. And what I'm hoping we can learn from this is the uh, processes and the implications of the processes that it are required to undertake a survey such as this. We know that we have a dearth of uh, data in our context in terms of uh, the extent and nature of substance use in general, but we're also aware of the implications of tobacco use. So uh, Sebe's talk is really going to talk to us about those processes. So Sebe, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, over to you. Thanks very much. Uh... All right, I'll just um, share my slides. Uh, may I just get confirmation uh, that uh, you can see my slide? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so um, Thanks again, uh, Prof. Sibeko, uh, for that introduction. And uh, so, indeed, I'm going to uh, take you all through the implementation process of the Global Adult Tobacco Survey South Africa. So, just by way of background, um, tobacco use is a major uh, preventable cause of premature death and disease globally, um, as we know this. Um, about 8 million plus people die every year because of tobacco-related illnesses. And um, about uh, 1.4 billion people who are aged 15 years and above are using tobacco in their various forms. 
Um, so the WHO has provided demand reducing measures uh, to scale back tobacco use um, via um, the EMPOWER, which is um, presented in the Framework Convention for Tobacco Control. Um, and really it speaks to these various measures, um, including monitoring tobacco use and prevention policies. So countries need to constantly monitor tobacco use and their prevention policies. Um, countries, countries need to protect people from tobacco smoke. They need to offer help to quit tobacco use. Um, they need to warn people about the dangers of tobacco. Um, they need to enforce bans on tobacco advertising, promotion and sponsorship, and they need to raise taxes on tobacco. So these, if in place, um, it is, um, they've been shown to um, help with reducing the demand for tobacco use in countries. And so surveillance and monitoring, of course, then becomes an important part um, of uh, ensuring that we see these things actually happen um, because then we need to we need to constantly be measuring where we are and what are the things that we still need to be doing so it's important to constantly do surveys as uh, ways of monitoring so one so there is then a system of such surveillance the global tobacco surveillance system and so under this there are various um, surveys that um, that form part of the system. The Global Adult Tobacco Survey, which is um, abbreviated to GATT, is one of them. Um, so that survey, which is what we are talking about today, um, is nationally representative. It's conducted at households and it's done among people who are 15 years and above. Um, alongside it, there's the Global Youth Tobacco Survey, which has also been conducted in South Africa in the past, um, but we are currently lacking uh, more recent data on this. Um, so this is a survey that's done among youth who are between the ages of 13 and 15, and um, it's conducted at schools. It's also nationally representative. Then we have the tobacco questions uh, for survey, the TQS. This is basically a subset of key questions that come from the GATS. And these questions are questions that can come, that can be bring, brought into um, other national, subnational, international surveys that aren't necessarily uh, tobacco focused. But they, if we introduce these questions in those surveys, then we can have uh, tobacco related data that can also speak to the empower uh, demand reducing strategies. So these are considered the gold standard of uh, tobacco survey, uh, tobacco surveys for, for monitoring tobacco use and um, key tobacco control policies. So the GATT has been implemented in various countries, uh, 34 to date, um, and South Africa has just <laughs> uh, implemented uh, the first GATT. Um, which is a really huge achievement. Um, we have uh, an internal joke about how many times we've, uh, as a country, have tried to implement the GATS. And um, I'm going to speak shortly about how we uh, visited um, Atlanta, Georgia, where we had the orientation. And we, they kept reminding us that you guys keep coming, but nothing comes out of it. So this time around, we went for the orientation and we actually conducted the GATT and successfully completed it. So that's, that's huge. But indeed, um, there's other countries that, have, that are ahead of us. Um, so in various continents of the world. So when I speak about the implementation, I thought I'll just break it up in various parts, um, but sort of map out um, the various steps. So firstly, um, I'll speak to the, uh, the, the, the preparation kind of phase. Um, so we had the GATS orientation, um, which I'll speak to more a little bit now. And then following that, we um, developed the protocol, the sample design, and we adapted the questionnaire. 
and we also uh, formed a scientific advisory committee that um, also um, sort of like provided some oversight over some of the things that um, we were doing in terms of the preparation and the conduct of the of the survey. So the GATS orientation was attended by um, people from the MRC, so myself and Dr. Catherine, and um, um, someone from the National Department of Health and the Health Ministry here in South Africa, and also um, somebody from the WHO country office. So it was four of us uh, who were attending and um, were being oriented to the GATS so that we can come and implement it in South Africa. And the program was really uh, made up of uh, various presentations that included uh, introduction to the GTSS, S GTSS and the GATS. And then also countries, each country uh, that was in attendance uh, needed to present on the current tobacco policies. And also um, these presentations sort of also highlighted some of the gaps that were being identified in the countries. Um, it also included um, going over the questionnaire processes and manuals. So because the, the GATS has been um, in place for a long time, um, it's really well established, like with an existing full questionnaire um, um, with, with manuals that sort of guide various parts of the process. Um, so so this, is, this is great because you kind of, it kind of eases the work in terms of like, you know, getting it uh, going. But in some cases, there is a little bit of rigidity because of if something has been done in a certain way for a long time, uh, there can be some resistance with changes that are needed, even to adapt it for a particular context. But we did sort of navigate those issues and um, managed to come through. Then um, we also had a session on data management training. So this was around introduction to a system, a software that is used for to capture data, um, to, to keep the data, um, issues of um, 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 setting up a server um, where the data will be kept and, and also issues around quality control, quality assurance, um, and the actual use of the handheld device that would be used for data collection. So all those, um, there was just some preliminary training of sort of getting countries uh, ready for this kind of work. Um, but this was just um, sort of like an introduction. Um, more training was held later on, just for your information. And then also we had like little sessions like um, with the countries, each country had their own session where uh, some discussion around sample design, um, questionnaire review and funding was had. So thinking through things like what would we need um, to, to, to put together our sample design. For example, we identified that we need to then get in contact with Statistics South Africa to get the master sampling frame. Um, we looked through the questionnaire to think about what would be appropriate for South Africa to include. Um, for example, um, some of the things that um, we wondered about was, what is it, which sort of products should we ask about in South Africa? A lot of countries um, don't ask about um, water pipe use, for example, but we know that this is a huge problem for South Africa among our young people. So for us, it was important to include it. So there are sort of those deliberations. And then also funding, like there was something, funding that was on the table, but we also had to think about um, would this be enough or do we need extra funding and how can we raise more funds if needed and so on. So here what I'm uh, presenting is uh, basically the plan in terms of the, the big picture plan in terms of the GTSS surveys um, and how they can inform uh, 
how like country policies. So firstly, um, the idea is to implement the survey, of course, um, and then analyze the data and write it up, the data that comes out of that survey, and then put that data into action. So use it to inform tobacco control policies and interventions and um, enhance program capacity. And then um, those programs and policies then need to be implemented and then they need to be tracked, evaluated and modified as needed. And then the survey needs to be repeated every three to five years so that we keep doing this um, sort of modification and, and implementation and, and yeah, monitoring all the time. So this basically the idea is that these surveys are ongoing. So every three to five years, we keep repeating so that we see where we are vis-a-vis -vis where we've been. That's just a picture of us who are attending the GETS orientation, people from uh, various countries. So there are a few um, organizations that um, were involved in uh, um, implementing the GATS South Africa. So the leading organizations were ourselves at the South African Medical Research Council. Um, and uh, it, the survey was anyway coordinated by the National Department of Health. So we were actually um, appointed by the National Department of Health to implement the survey on their behalf. And then we had Stats South Africa to provide us some key population level materials. As I indicated earlier, um, one of those was the uh, master sampling frame. Then we had the collaborating organizations, um, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization, and Research Triangle International. Then we also had um, Geospace International, um, who was appointed to conduct the fieldwork for the study. Um, and this uh, appointment was done by a uh, uh, a tender process, so it was competitive and they put in a, a bid that was uh, a winning bid. So we had um, our protocol reviewed by various committees. Firstly, the GATS or the GTSS system has um, various review committees um, for various parts of the work. So there's a protocol review committee that looks at the protocol, the sample design review committee that looks at the sample design, and the questionnaire review committee that looks at the questionnaire. So it's quite an intense process um, to ensure that really that it's well planned so that we have reliable data to work with and data that is comparable to other countries. Then we also had at the MRC the SAMRC scientific review uh, process um, and the um, ethics uh, review via the ethics research committee. So in terms of the scientific advisory board, I mean, scientific advisory committee, um, it was represent, there was representation from various institutions, so including us here at the South African Medical Research Council, we had three people. Now, this is excluding the project team. Um, these are people who are outside of the project team, like people are in, who are outside of um, the people who are implementing the, the gap. So we had three people from the SAMRC, and then we had um, someone from Africa Center for Tobacco Industry Monitoring and Policy Research, also known as ATOM. We had two individuals from Statistics South Africa, had two individuals from res the research unit on the economics of uh, excisable products, or what um, they were otherwise known as REAP, also housed at uh, the University of Cape Town. We had someone from National Department of Health and someone from World Health Organization country office. Uh, now coming to the second part of the implementation flow. Um, when we had had the review processes done and had feedback um, and 
had the protocol approved. Um, we then uh, translated the questionnaire and following which we had the pretest, then revised the questionnaire, which um, fed into the main survey. And I'll go into this little bit uh, in a little bit more detail. So the questionnaire content really speaks to the empower, as I indicated earlier. So um, we have uh, questions around prevalence um, and age of initiation. So that's uh, things around current tobacco use um, and smoking, uh, use of novel nicotine and tobacco products, etc. Um, and those speak to the monitoring bit, monitoring use and policies. Then we have exposure to secondhand smoke in public places, workplace and home, which speaks to the protecting people from secondhand smoking. Um, we have questions around first, first cigarette of the day, intention to quit, attempts to quit, and advice uh, about quitting from healthcare providers. And that speaks to the offer help to quit. And we had um, questions around beliefs about dangers of smoking or use of tobacco and uh, nicotine products, impact of health warnings, impact of anti-cigarette and anti-tobacco advertisement, um, and that speaks to the warning of dangers around, uh, around tobacco and nicotine product usage. Um, had questions about advertising and promotion of tobacco and nicotine products, it speaks to enforcing marketing bans. And then finally, we had questions around cost and affordability of uh, cigarettes and tobacco and expenditure on cigarettes and tobacco. And that speaks to raising prices or raising taxes on tobacco and nicotine products. So the questionnaire was originally in English and then we translated it to 10 other official languages and then back translated. Uh, so it was quite a, an intense process. Um, um, which I think I won't go into uh, right now, but um, yeah, it was quite uh, thoroughly done. Then um, those, uh, the English as well as those translated versions were loaded onto uh, the GTSA system, which is really the system, the, um, the software um, that gets loaded onto the handheld devices. And then uh, those devices are then used um, to access the software and um, used to administer the questionnaire. So they were loaded on there and we had, um, but before that rather, we had um, a virtual translation review session between the translators and um, colleagues from RTI as well as CDC, which I've not included here. So they they um, went through this with each of the translators of a language. They went through the entire um, questionnaire to look at each question and each response option to make sure that um, there's nothing that's been missed and um, things are reading properly. Um, and then just a note that, I mean, this is about questionnaire translation, but in, we, we also uh, translated and back translated the written informed consent forms and participant information sheets. Uh, we then conducted the pre-test um, and the aim of this pre-test was to test survey procedures and uh, questionnaire and its translated versions. And uh, the methods training and data collection, um, we had a purpose of sample of 122 dwelling units in Gauteng. So initially we wanted 100 and we oversampled to ensure that we get 100 and um, we ended up with uh, more than the 100 which is fine, um, served our purposes. Um, then we recruited and trained field workers and um, the training uh, was in a lecture format as well as uh, using role play methods. And then um, the field workers collected the data and uh, we had a debriefing session um, when the interviews were completed at the very end of um, after the 122 interviews had been completed. And uh, we noted lessons from the debriefing sessions that would then inform 
uh, the next stages. So one issue was thinking of data, and this is around uh, when people send and transfer their data when they've completed a questionnaire. There were some issues regarding um, that appearing on the server where the data manager is sitting and is viewing the data from, from his desk. So we, we realized that we needed to um, sort of uh, spend more time on training people on this aspect to ensure that they know how to do that in such a way that uh, there are no issues with the transfer of data and also to put in a mechanism in place that um, indicates to the data manager that um, a, qu a question has been completed. So um, he needs to make sure that it appears on the server or follows up on it. Um, then in terms of the translated questionnaires, we, we, what we found was that um, there were some cultural nuances that had been missed with some of the translations that needed to be taken into account and changed. Um, so for example, uh, the language sometimes was more appropriate for younger people, but not older people. So we needed to make sure that um, the language covers all age groups. So we made those changes. Um, and yeah, so the data manager received the virtual training on the GTSS system. Also sort of like um, around this time when we were preparing for the pretest and so on, he had quite an intense um, training um, session on the GTSS system and just data management of GATS in general. So the next part is um, um, the mapping and listing, which also fed into the survey, and I'll just go into a little bit more detail on that. So the aim here was to generate a list of uh, dwelling units to be sampled for the main survey. And here um, we obtained a master sampling frame from StatSA, which I've been talking about for some time now. So this basically is, um, it gives us information uh, for us to be able to uh, take, um, so the country has been divided into um, small little areas that can be sampled um, in a way that can be representative um, of the whole country. So, so this uh, document assists with uh, making sure that we are able, we have that information to be able to help us sample uh, these small areas. Um, so it's been done, done like this for, for the purposes of research as well as um, census in South Africa. Um, so from the master sampling frame, then we selected um, primary sampling units uh, from each of the nine provinces. Um, then we recruited and trained field workers, again, using lecture, lecture format type of uh, methods and role plays. And at the end of the training, like it was part of the training, but um, towards the end, we also um, had a practice session for the field workers to sort of go and do this um, mapping and listing in the area around the training venue. So to get off like to get practical training and how to do it before they actually go out into the field. Um, then after that they then set off to go and do to visit all the primary sampling units that had been selected. And here really they needed to uh, note all the structures that are at those uh, PSUs. So they had to give it a give each structure a classification code. They need to tell us if this is a school or is it a dwelling unit, is it a hospital? And all of this is so that we can be able to see what are the structures that meet our inclusion criteria so that we can know which are the structures that can be included in the sample. Then part four is now the main survey. So we conducted the main survey, having done um, the pretest and the mapping and listing, which fed into uh, how we'll actually go
go about doing the main survey. And following the main survey, we then um, uh, cleaned the data and analyzed it. And we prepared um, then um, documents to disseminate uh, the information. So the one document is a fact sheet, which, had, which was prepared and was released on World Notabaku Day this year, the 31st of May. And we are currently working on uh, compiling the country report, which we hope we, we're planning to release next year, um, also on World Notabaku Day. So I'm just gonna go into uh, some more detail around the main survey. So the aim of the main survey was to generate rural, urban, and nationally representative data on adult tobacco use and key tobacco control measures that can be compared with those of other GATS implementing countries. So the method, um, it was cross-sectional in design. It was um, nationally representative um, and it was done at household level. Um, and we used a multi-stage stratified sampling procedure. And the target population was adults who were aged 15 years and above, uh, who were not institutionalized and who were usual residents of the country. So by that, we meant that they needed to have um, spent six of the past 12 months in South Africa. And they also had to be usual residents in the household. So similarly, they needed to have spent six at least six of the past 12 months um, in that household. So we had a three-stage sampling design. So at the first stage, we selected the primary sampling units and we used um, um, the probability proportional to size approach. Um, then secondly, we selected the dwelling units within the PSUs and we used systematic sampling. And then finally, we used a random selection approach to select one household member. And this selection was done after household screening. So of course, the member had to be uh, aged 15 years and above. So in some cases, we had some conditional modification of the sampling design. So, um, Generally, it was three stage, but sometimes it would be four stage. Um, and I don't think we had a case where we had a five stage sampling uh, design, although this could have been, um, it was a possibility, but I don't think we had it ever. Anyway, so what happened was if we were in an informal settlement, um, we started off by um, segmenting the, the area because um, Informal settlements tend to be quite um, dense in population. And so they tend to be congested and they're not well demarcated. So we needed to do our own segmentation and then select from, uh, so we, we, we segmented um, um, each informal settlement into um, 50, um, okay, this needs verification. So anyway, uh, we, see, we we segmented it. Maybe let me not say by how many exactly. Um, and then we selected randomly one of them. And then once that was done, then we um, selected um, the DU and the household member. And then in some cases, before we would select the household member, um, we may find when we select a DU that there were actually more than one household in that uh, dwelling unit. And then we would first need to randomly select a household member. Um, sorry, not a household. We would first randomly select a household and then from there select a household member. So our sample sizes, we, um, so at PSU level, we had a target of 121. And in the end, we had 120 that we successfully included. 
Um, and then if we look at them by urban versus rural, at Target we had 55 urban and 66 rural. Um, and in the end we had we included 55 urbans so we included all that we had target to include 65 rural so we just missed one there and then at household and individual level we targeted to uh, get 7245 people um, at household the actual number was 6425 and at individual level it was 6311 So we, we conducted training for the field workers, of course, and um, this was led by the uh, South African Medical Research Council team with assistance from Geospace, the company that actually implemented the field work. And um, we did this alongside the National Department of Health. Um, and then we also had support from the collaborating organizations um, which are CDC and the WHO country, Afro and country office. Um, and the training was a five day face to face uh, training with strict compliance to COVID-19 protocols and conducted in Gauteng. Um, so everybody, like as much as people were going to be working in different provinces, we had it all in one place, everyone from who will be working with it, whichever province uh, was stationed in this one place where we conducted the training with everybody. And um, again, it was uh, didactic and um, use of didactic methods as well as role play. And we also had um, mock interviews that were conducted in English and local languages to ensure that people were comfortable um, in both English and the local languages. And now I'm just showing some pictures of um, the training in progress, as well as a picture of us together, um, posing for a photo with uh, people in the in the gear, the field of gear. And then um, how we collected the data, I'm just going to show here how we collected the data, the flow. Um, so we started off by um, getting electronic consent from the household respondent. Um, so people would go to a selected dwelling unit, introduce themselves, and the survey gives some brief information about the survey, get an indication of whether the individual is interested in taking part. And if they are, they would then um, provide electronic consent. So uh, basically, they just need to indicate in the tablet that uh, the individual has consented to take part. Um, then the next step would be to screen that household respondent for COVID-19. Also, that was done with uh, the handheld device. And then the household questionnaire um, would be done. So that was more like screening at the household level. So things that were looked at were for example, how many people live in this household? How many of them uh, are 15 years and above? And what are their names so that we can be able to um, have a list of the people that are 15 years and above living in that household, which would then allow for the next stage, which I'm um, where the arrow is going, where it's random selection of household member. So then it would. Um, the system would select from those people that are listed. Um, one person would then um, be eligible to take part in the individual interview. And then if that person is willing to take part, then they would provide written informed consent as well as electronic informed consent. And then they would um, uh, respond to the individual questionnaire questions. And at the end of the interview, they'd be provided with a 50 rand airtime, grocery, or electricity voucher as reimbursement. And then the data would be transferred to the server.
So in terms of the data collection, um, just a little bit more information around this. So it was facilitated by Geospace, um, as indicated. Um, it was conducted by 44 trained field workers. Um, so we had um, 11 teams. So we had 11 supervisors with uh, 33 field workers. And uh, the data was collected using handheld devices, as indicated. And we had, so these tablets were programmed with various software. So we had the main software, as we think the main software, the GTSS software, which um, really had the questionnaire, but also other details about, for example, the dwelling unit like, provided details of like the address to make sure that um, we have the correct details and the correct dwelling unit that is included in the in, in the survey. Um, this software also um, had this uh, random selection of household member um, functionality. Then we also had uh, a map enterprise app which was used by Geospace to monitor data collection from the side. Um, also the, the Kobo software um, which could be used for various things. It was also um, included by Geospace, um, but for our purposes, um, it was used to randomly select households where there was more than one household in the, in the dwelling unit. Then we had what was called Flash, and through this app, uh, the field workers were able to buy the vouchers and be able to send them to our respondents. So data collection uh, took place over three and a half months and it was done face to face at each of the households uh, using tablets. Um, and the data was transferred from the handheld devices to the central database every day with, uh, in fact, as soon as the data or the interview was completed, it was transferred to the server. Um, and there were, we had data transmission protocols in place, so people knew how to, by when and how they need to do this. And we had, throughout the data collection period, we had a full-time data manager who monitored the collected data on a daily basis and um, would send uh, reports every week um, on the status of the data collection. There's just some pictures of uh, the field workers out in the field. And uh, so we conducted this uh, survey in the midst of COVID-19 um, at a time when it seemed <laughs> almost impossible really to be going around to people's houses and um, asking for access and, and interview time. Uh, so it was important for us to have like a strict protocol in place um, to protect the field workers as well as uh, participants as much as we could. Um, so the field workers self-screened every morning uh, to check themselves for temperature, um, issues for symptoms and risk exposures. Um, they also wore face masks throughout field work. Um, they, we provided participants with face masks so the field worker when they get to a dwelling unit, so they would provide a face mask to the participants um, to ensure that they have a face mask to use throughout the interview process. Um, and the field workers sanitized their cars before field work every day. And they also sanitized um, respondents. Um, and they obviously conducted the screening interview, screening for COVID interview. And if respondents were screened positive for COVID, for COVID risk, rather, um, they would, we would then have the field workers revisit that household only 10 days later um, in line with the, the guidelines of the time. Um, and this, the compliance here was monitored quite closely. 
uh, to the point that um, the data manager had to provide them for them to be able to go back to the household and open that case in their tablet they had to get a, a code uh, from the data manager and they would not be able to uh, do anything with that interview unless they put in that code from the data manager. So in terms of quality assurance, um, the, as I indicated, uh, Geospace uh, used the software to monitor data collection, uh, the map enterprise. So that was helpful in terms of being able to determine um, where an interview was done and whether it was close to um, the dwelling unit where it should have been conducted. Uh, field workers were asked to provide comments for uh, interviews that were not completed. So they had to select a visit outcome code. Um, we had codes for um, anticipated outcomes, like for example, nobody at home had a particular code. Um, um, trying to think of others. Um, a vacant building would have a particular code and so on. And then they also had to provide comments in terms of maybe um, I've come here for the second time this week. Um, this is on date X um, and I've found that there's nobody at home, for example. So we use this to sort of like cross check with the outcome codes, um, whether things are telling and um, whether the reason sort of goes along with, um, with, with, the, with the visit outcome. And we had meetings to sort of like look through these things and, and provide support as needed, where we found that we, maybe some support is needed in the field. Um, and then field workers had to give us uh, photos for where they find that a building is vacant or uh, there's just vacant land. And so that helped us to sort of verify that indeed this is the case. Um, it's always difficult when field workers are out in the field and you are in the office and you're kind of like not sure uh, what's happening. So this was helpful in terms of the provision of photos so that we could also see from our side um, what they are finding in the field. Um, and then I made an example earlier about COVID-19, the need for a code for field workers to be able to open a case. So there were other cases where they needed codes to be able to open cases um, where for certain conditions, um, access was restricted to the data manager. And so they would need a code to be able to um, open those cases. Um, and then we had monthly meetings with the field workers to pick up on maybe field challenges, um, troubleshoot any issues that they, they, they bring up and also to provide support. Um, and then the data manager um, conducted daily checks on the data that was on the server and um, would um, act on any issues that come up daily. So this was helpful in that things could be dealt with um, at the time that um, they are picked up so timelessly. And then we also had a weekly meeting ask the project team to review the data collection um, and we would at these meetings also review a weekly report from the data manager. So this slide um, shows you the target um, sample from each of the provinces that you'll see in the light blue. And then the darker blue shows you what was actually reached. And what you'll see is that um, we had quite a good turnout um, in terms of um, trying to meet our targets. The lowest that we found was um, Western Cape, um, where we were able to only reach 77.3 people, percent of the people. Um, and the highest was uh, North Wales, we were able to reach about 97.8%. 97, 97 but in general, um, we had um, percentages that were higher than 80%. So generally just a good response all around. 
in terms of reach of the target sample. Um, and then just a little bit more on this. So our response rate at the household interview was 93%. So we completed as I indicated earlier 6,424 uh, interviews. So when we calculated the response rate, just uh, for information, we, we excluded um, those um, structures that were that we found unoccupied or vacant or where um, the address was not a dwelling unit because um, the idea is that these should not have been included anyway. But of course, uh, ideally one would leave these out based on the mapping and listing um, exercise. But um, it was not always possible to determine this that the mapping and listing. For example, it could be that um, people have moved between the time that we we completed the mapping and listing and the actual start of the main survey. Or it could be that um, um, we couldn't have known that, for example, a dwelling unit is being used for a business. For example, um, BNBs, um, they can seem like a dwelling structure when it's actually a place of business. Then at the individual level, the response rate was 98.4%, um, which is really excellent. And then here, what we left out um, was uh, where there was an indication that this person was ineligible. Um, so again, that's because the people should not have been included in the first place. Then the overall response rate is um, the household response rate by the, the individual response rate. And so in the end, it's 91.5%. Uh, so to go into some of the challenges that we experienced when we conducted the survey or the, the survey in general, uh, we had um, we encountered lengthy lengthy process with gaining access to some of the PSUs. In some cases, this extended to periods of um, about two weeks, so which often delayed the actual survey um, data collection. And um, initially, in fact, we thought that we had planned on uh, budgeted on finishing the survey within three months, the data collection and. But in the end, we exceeded by about another another two weeks or so. So, um, so that did um, that did mean that we needed more resources than we had planned for. And then um, we COVID nineteen wasn't that much of an issue, surprisingly to us, because we we actually anticipated that we will come into all sorts of virus problems during the survey in the, um, in the midst of COVID. But it did sort of prevent us from getting access to one uh, farm and they were concerned that they are a food farm and they had fear of contamination if um, they let our team in and in, if, if um, any of them um, turn out to, to have COVID. Then we had a few respondents who had a fear of signing informed consent forms. Um, then we also, in some cases, uh, we had some issues with the reimbursement, um, uh, particularly in remote areas where the 50 rands was. Um, so in some cases, you'd find that people don't have cell phones because um, particularly the older generation, so they, they the airtime is not useful for them. Um, they don't use electricity, uh, prepaid electricity, therefore the electricity voucher is not useful. Then the grocery voucher, it means them traveling to very far away places to be able to use it. So it was those challenges, but um, uh, people did, were able to work around them. Um, 
Then we had some minor issues around the GTSS software for the questionnaire. We had some issues with the syncing of data. Sometimes uh, field workers would um, indicate that they've sent, they've transferred their data, but it would not show on the server. Um, and eventually it would, but it meant that um, we weren't always sure how many interviews had been collected conducted and concluded at this particular time. Um, but fortunately, we had um, other software in place like the Map Enterprise from Geospace, which, which we could um, cross-check with. Um, then we had issues sometimes with um, pre-assigned dwelling units to particular devices. So the, the preferred method by the GTSS team is that uh, the, the dwelling units that have been selected are um, assigned to particular individuals within teams. But the problem was then that if that person has done their dwelling units and they've completed their list um, and somebody else in the team still has a lot to do, then that team sort of has to stay in that one place until everyone is finished. So it's sort of like um, interfered with um, flexibility of, around uh, visiting various different places, um, moving on basically from a particular space. So, but we worked around this and we sort of implemented something different where people could be, people could take, um, for example, if someone is sick and they can't, um, um, they can't conduct interviews for a particular day, then somebody else can use their tablet and conduct those interviews, something like that. And then there were instances where we couldn't uh, continue with uh, the field work. Um, in one instance, it was around the COVID-19 third wave in Gauteng. And then in KZN, it was because of uh, protests in the province. Um, so for this time, we suspended field work in these areas and we transferred the team to co-work elsewhere um, until things have, have, uh, had calmed. And then the teams came with the teams that they had assisted. And that sort of helped the work move uh, quickly. And then, of course, I had already touched on this, that we had to extend the field work and this required additional resources. And then in terms of successes, um, we had uh, an overall response rate of 91.5%. Um, so that's just an error here, the 0.6%. Um, so this was uh, great compared to uh, surveys in general in South Africa, but also because, more so, because we conducted the survey in the midst of uh, COVID and um, yeah, as I indicated earlier, that uh, we had, we actually had, were quite anxious about uh, how people might respond. And we gained access to all uh, the PSUs that we selected except one. Um, and then we generally had good reception at household. Our field workers reported that they were really well received. Um, and this included some high wall areas. Um, and then we completed the fieldwork without any reports of incidences of uh, COVID-19 among the field workers or uh, crime-related victimization or other victimization of the teams. Yeah, I just want to, so that brings me to the end of my uh, part of the presentation and I want to just acknowledge all the various players um, that have played their part a big thank you to them and a big thank you particularly to participants and um, the gatekeeping authorities for, for their willingness to participate and to grant us access to, to places that we selected. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sebi, for uh, that comprehensive overview of the, um, the processes of the project. Are uh, you really talking about taking advantage of existing um, international best practice platforms, uh, giving us an idea of the local adaptation and appropriateness of the, of the tools used and the strategy 
and for me importantly highlighting the collaboration and impl implantation of some of the membership of the collaboration within the policy making machinery of the country which i think really speaks to that conversion to the policy uh, development which um, the follow-up webinar will focus on tomorrow so thank you so with that i'll move on to introducing um, dr catherine Egbe, who's a specialist scientist uh, in the Alcohol, Tobacco and Other Drug Research Unit at the SMRC. She has a PhD in Psychology and, human, uh, and Health Promotion from UKZN uh, in Durban, my home. Uh, and she is alumna of the prestigious Centre for um, Tobacco Control uh, Research and Education at the University of California, San Francisco, a World Health Organization collaborating Centre for Tobacco Control. So we're in excellent hands here. Uh, Dr. Egbe is a member of the Society for Nicotine and Tobacco Research and was a fall 2016 Global Health Network Spotlight winner. So she's currently the lead investigator for the South Africa, for the GATS uh, Survey 2021, uh, Tobacco Endgame in South Africa and the university students' uh, exposure to e-cigarette and hookah marketing studies. So very exciting work underway there. She is uh, well published with 50 academic publications and 43 papers in peer-reviewed journals. So Catherine's gonna come through and tell us what they found uh, with the service. So Catherine, really looking forward to hearing um, what follows. So those of us who have to go off, I know that the UCT colleagues may need to uh, bow out. Uh, there will be a recording of this session. Um, we will be going on for another half hour. And please don't forget that we have a part two tomorrow uh, where if you have any questions about today's work, you can con connect with us again tomorrow as well for a follow-up. So, uh, Catherine, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Bebo. Um, please confirm if you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Hello? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, can. great. Okay, thank you. So, I will be um, just uh, touching on some of the key results um, of the GATS. I must say that uh, I always like to mention that the um, GATS is like the gift that keeps on giving because there's so much to see about tobacco use in the country um, when you look into the GATS results. Well, so what I'm, what I'm presenting to you today is just key highlights. Um, and then I'll be touching on tobacco and e-cigarette use prevalence, use, uh, prevalence uh, um, um, estimates as well as cessation, smoke, secondhand uh, smoke exposure, and economics very briefly, and media very briefly, and their knowledge, attitude, and perception. So um, while we're doing the GATS, uh, because our unit deals on issues related to substance use, the broad spectrum of su substance use, um, uh, our um, director insisted that we should include some questions on um, cannabis use. So I will share with you what we found about cannabis use in South Africa as well. So before I go into the results proper, I need to, um, you know, explain the difference between the different types of tobacco products that we included in our survey, like Sebe said. And so we have the traditional tobacco products, which uh, can be categorized as uh, combustible and non-combustible products or smoked tobacco products or smokeless tobacco products. You can see the pictures here. So your traditional cigarettes, you have the cigars, and then you have the roll your own uh, um, cigarettes, as well as the cigarillos, the little cigars, and the pipes. So these are the smoked products. So when we're talking about tobacco smoking, we're talking about prevalence of use of these products. And then we go on to the smokeless tobacco products. These are products that you do not need to burn before you, um, as you consume them. That doesn't mean you don't, they don't go through any uh, heating process in, the, in, in, in making them, but where, while consuming them, the consumer doesn't need to burn them. And so you have the snuff, the snooze, uh, the chew tobacco, and so on. And so when I talk about smokeless tobacco products, I mean these products. We also have these um, products I call the re-emerging tobacco products. So, or the novel tobacco products and re-emerging tobacco products. So, of course, we, we've, we, we must have heard about hookah or uh, what is popularly called hubbly bubbly in South Africa or shisha. Uh, this is a re-emerging tobacco product because it used to be uh, prevalent and popular in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, but is now uh, has now become a global uh, product, and then we have the heated tobacco products, uh, which is 
very much like the e-cigarettes, many people actually confuse uh, um, these two products as the e-cigarettes and the heated tobacco products because of their sleek design. The heated tobacco products use very tiny, um, not very tiny, but smaller uh, cigarette sticks that are called heats. Um, and that's what you see here in the picture um, under here. And then we have the, the Novel Nicotine products. These only contain nicotine. They do not contain tobacco. Nicotine, of course, is, con is present in, in the tobacco products as well. Uh, but the Novel Nicotine products, they include the e-cigarette as you know them, um, they have different generations. We have the disposable ones. We have um, also the um, nicotine, um, um, the, the um, smoke, not smokeless, but the nicotine pouch, or um, it's, it's actually nicotine contained in um, little bags, just like the snooze, but this time you have only nicotine in them. Um, so these are um, novel products. We didn't look at um, nicotine pouches in the guts, but I'm just showing you these products. So onto the results. Uh, what we found in South Africa is that about 29% uh, uh, of South Africans use various types of tobacco products. Now this doesn't include the nicotine products. And then if you want to disintegrate this um, into the smoked and smokeless products, we found that about 4.3% um, uh, of South Africans are using smokeless products, um, smokeless tobacco products, and there are more women than men using uh, smokeless tobacco products. But when you look at my at my at your left, you see the smoked products, and you find that there are more men than women using the smoked products. So the smoked products, we had almost 26% of South Africans using these products, but a very uh, high percentage for men, uh, showing slightly more than 40% of men using the smoke products. Now, when we looked at the um, distribution of um, the use of um, the smoke products and even the cigarettes uh, on their own, we found out that uh, there is a, a, a pattern of use in the provinces starting with uh, the Northern Cape having the highest prevalence of uh, use of uh, smoked products, as well as the highest prevalence of cigarettes. So when we talk about cigarettes, we mean manufacture cigarettes and roll your own. So when we talk about manufacture cigarettes alone, then that, that means only the manufacture cigarettes like you know them. But when we talk about cigarettes, we mean both the manufacture cigarettes and the roll your own, the one you people put um, shredded tobacco leaves in papers and roll them by themselves. I think that was made popular by the uh, uh, one of the ministers when it, she talked about Zol uh, during the COVID-19 lockdown ban. So um, also with uh, manufacture cigarettes is the same pattern starting with Northern Cape with the highest prevalence and Limpopo with the lowest prevalence. And so we see that uh, it's the same um, issues that we're dealing with um, in the provinces. For, you know, I, I, I had to pull up this from the Botswana country report, uh, GATS country report, because I wanted to see how South Africa was performing compared to other African countries that have uh, implemented the GATS. And you can see that the highest prevalence we've had before South Africa was in Botswana with almost 18%. And here we are dealing with um, about uh, almost 30% in South Africa. I think that this should worry any of us uh, who is concerned about uh, substance use. Looking at electronic cigarette use, I do not think that there's any other African country that has uh, looked at e-cigarette use because these products are fairly new in the market. Uh, we found that um, about 6.2% of South Africans have used e-cigarettes either currently or before. But for current users, this was 2.2%. But when we looked at the age distribution of those using these products, we found that there are more people using these products uh, in the younger age groups than the um, uh, older age groups. We often hear the industry, uh, the e-cigarette industry, claiming that their products are for cigarette smokers. But what we found was that the, the, this age group that is the highest prevalence of use, that has the highest prevalence of use, is not the highest prevalence of, uh, uh, do not have the highest prevalence of smoking. I will show you another slide that will show you more about that. 
Now, when we looked at the duration of daily use of electronic cigarettes, what we found was that more than 20% of those currently using e-cigarettes have been using them for more than two years, which gives us the impression that these uh, persons are, uh, are maybe addicted to the product already. And then uh, only um, for those who have used it for less than one month, they were almost 31%. And for those who have used it between one to two years, about 10%. Um, and this is the slide I wanted to show you to um, show the prevalence of use of uh, both smoked products, cigarettes, hookah, and e-cigarettes. And you can see the um, red rectangles showing you the highest prevalence of smoked products and um, cigarettes being in the 45 to 64 years age bracket. Uh, but then you find that the newer products, uh, the e-cigarettes and hookah, they are more prevalent in, uh, among the 15 to 24 years age bracket. And which of course is worrisome for us because um, these could be some people who may not even be using uh, um, traditional products, traditional cigarettes. For cessation, what we found was that about 41% of South Africans made a quit attempt within the last year of the survey. Um, there were very slightly more men than women who made that quit attempt. Uh, but we also found that um, about two thirds of the smokers uh, were thinking of or planning to quit, which is good news for us because uh, we want to see people stop smoking. So I'm um, seeing two thirds of smokers indicating that they were planning or thinking about quitting was uh, good uh, public health news for us. Um, we also checked um, how many of um, those or the percentage of those or proportion of those who visited the healthcare, their healthcare providers during that period um, and whether they were advised to quit or not. And we found that only about 43% of those of smokers who visited their healthcare providers were advised to quit. We think that this could be better because We've, uh, we know that the evidence shows that if you are uh, even asked about your smoking behavior, it's shown to instigate or to um, initiate the thought of quitting, which if you know the stages of change and just thinking about quitting is a good, way, is a good place to start. For former daily smokers, we found about uh, almost 11% of those who were smoking daily in the past uh, had quit and um, for us, uh, for the guards, uh, quitting was uh, for those who have quit within the past 12 months. So past 12 months quitting. Um, we also looked at those who had, um, had quit and uh, what, they were think um, uh, what they were thinking about or what were their reasons for quitting or what were their reasons for thinking about quitting. We found that about 63% wanted to quit because of the concern for their health. And we've also found that about 12% of smokers um, said they had quit before the survey. Now, this figure is different from the one you saw the, in, the, in, the, in the previous slide because the previous slide was looking at those who were daily smoking. But this slide is looking at those who were, some of them were not daily smokers, but they had quit. So um, slightly, uh, almost 12% of smokers had quit within the, uh, the last 12 months of the survey. When we asked about the, their means of quitting, their methods of quitting, uh, we found that about 81% had quit without assistance, uh, which we described as quitting cold turkey. Um, and then about 4% had used uh, various medications and 2.9% um, had used um, counseling and advice. We included e-cigarettes here because we included it in our survey. We want to mention that this is not an evidence-based approach to quitting. And you can see that it was the least used. We have indeed conducted other studies in South Africa that has shown that um, e-cigarette was not effective in helping smokers to quit for good. Um, in terms of exposure to secondhand smoke, I, I'll just highlight uh, um, two uh, of these um, findings. Um, among those who went to work, if you can remember um, uh, well, you find you remember that um, during the lockdown, not everyone was working from the office. So this question was particularly posed to those who were 
working in the office. We're working in indoors and only about um, about 11% um, reported that they were, they were exposed to secondhand smoke. But um, the, I think the most troubling one is the one you find with bars, taverns, pubs, and shabins, and nightclubs. Uh, we asked those who had visited these venues to indicate whether they've been exposed to secondhand smoke, and uh, almost uh, a quarter of them reported to be exposed to secondhand smoke. This for us is worrisome because uh, we know that um, in these um, uh, entertainment venues, they are supposed to have designated smoking areas. And this particularly shows that uh, the, the designated smoking areas may not be, uh, are not really functional, are not really help, helping, or they're not protecting non-smokers. Concerning the use, of, uh, the amount of money spent on cigarettes, uh, the, the median amount spent on a pack of 20 cigarettes was found to be about 25 rand, and uh, monthly expenses of uh, uh, on cigarettes was found to be about 263 rands. If you look at um, the fact that this represents almost 75% of uh, what a person who is on a child's grant is receiving, you would understand that if such a person is a smoker, uh, it means most of the money is being spent on uh, on, on, on maintaining the habit. We also asked questions on whether um, participants were uh, exposed to advertisement of um, tobacco products or, uh, or electronic uh, cigarettes. And we found that almost 30% of the adults said they noticed advertising, promotion, and sponsorship. Um, about 19% said they noticed ads on tobacco products in stores. And about 6% said they noticed on posters, and uh, also about 6% said they noticed on social media. Uh, and among these, about 11% of those aged 15 to 24 years noticed ads on social media. I just want to mention uh, why I'm, I'm making the, the, the distinction of, um, um, about the age, because the GATS only looks at people aged 15 years and above. The GYTS, which South Africa has conducted, um, um, I think, four times, three or four times. Um, we conducted the last GYTS in 2011. We're hoping that we conduct a, uh, conduct one soon. Um, takes care of that, that. The GYTS takes care of those below 15. And so the GATS takes care of those above 15. That's why I'm mentioning the youngest age group um, in the GATS survey. Um, sorry. So um, I think that for knowledge, attitude, and perception, um, for me, particularly as a health promotion specialist, uh, I think this was uh, good for me to see, uh, knowing that the work we're doing in tobacco control um, is getting to the people because about 93% uh, of South Africans said they believe that smoking can cause serious illnesses. They also, uh, the same number, about 93% also believe that when you breathe other people's uh, smoke, you could also um, um, contract serious illnesses. Um, about 88% said they support a ban on indoor workplaces, a, a ban on smoking in indoor workplaces and in um, a certain uh, public places. And um, almost 80% believe that Smokeless tobacco use can cause serious illnesses. And 73% um, said they support an increase in taxes on tobacco products. So um, this is the slide on cannabis use. Um, it's not traditionally part of the guides to do any other um, drug, but we had to uh, motivate to add this, given the fact that um, the um, Supreme, the Constitutional Court had, had allowed South Africans to privately use cannabis. So what we found was that um, about 9% of South Africans reported past 30 days use, um, while about 9.1% uh, said they were former users of cannabis. That is darker. And this is the team, the core uh, GATS SA team from left, we have Loratu Mahura from the Department of Health and myself, and then uh, Mr. Eugene Makhlekla from the WHO country office, 
in South Africa and um, Sebe, Sebenzile Nkosi, who is the project manager. And of course, Muketwa Rondani, who is our data manager, who did an amazing job making sure that our data was uh, very much um, usable. Um, I'd like to thank the Department of Health uh, for um, trusting us with this project because this project was done on behalf of the Department of Health. Uh, partners, the CDC, the CDC Foundation, Research Triangle International, and the Bloomberg Philanthropies for the funds. And the WHO country office and the Afro office, uh, uh, the, the, we owe them special uh, thanks for their support. Statistics South Africa for the, um, the master sample frame they provided and for technical advice they gave us um, as, as members of the scientific advisory committee. And other members of the advisory committee, um, whom um, I think uh, Sebe has done justice to mention them well, uh, we cannot thank Geospace International enough because they gave us dedicated field workers who were able to put their all into the survey and make sure that they gave us uh, the survey as uh, at a standard that we wanted. Um, and we thank the statistician in, uh, who was in um, MRC as well, who, who designed this, the sample, um, Professor Sam Manda, who is now in the University of Pretoria. And of course, um, other members of our research team in SAMRC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Please don't go away. Uh, seeing as we have a couple of minutes, um, I maybe I can just pose this question to you from Peter Ako. Um, maybe you could quickly, we're going to leave it for tomorrow, but I think we have a few moments. So okay. here's the full question. So it's a two part question. The first question is 6,311 completed interviews is only 0.01% of the population, assuming 60 million being the population. Is this sufficient to draw valuable conclusions for the general populations? Um, in his view, it seems like a fairly small sample size for overall um, accuracy. So the follow-up question there is, according to the data, uh, if 12% of smokers quit in the last year, how is it that the prevalence has increased from about 20% uh, to the current 30%. Um, so okay. if you could, yes, thank you. Yeah, excellent questions, I must say. Um, so just to mention that um, uh, when Dr. Nkosi was making a presentation, she mentioned that there was uh, a, a systematic way of, of, get, of getting the sample. So this is not a sample that was just randomly selected, uh, you know, out of the blues. We had to make sure that they were representative of the national population. So we got the master sample frame from the department, uh, from the from Statistics South Africa, and then we made sure that we got um, 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 the PSUs that were representative of the. Uh, whole population. And for, for, for those who do um, statistics and who are in epidemiology, you know that um, doing epidemiological studies is not like a census. You cannot um, get the uh, prevalence of every single person in South Africa. You have to get a sample that represents the national population. And, 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 and then afterwards, um, what we, we, we didn't mention was that there was waiting also done and taking into cognizance all the um, the, 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 the sampling uh, uh, stages and making sure that the sample was representative of the national population of South Africa. So all those things were done statistically, and so we can confidently say that it's representative of the, the country. To the follow-up question, um, I think that we must understand that there are other studies that have, uh, con that have um, um, looked at smoking prevalence in South Africa have not been GATT. This is the very first time that we're doing the GATT in South Africa. So you cannot really compare the prevalence of GATT uh, with that of, for example, the um, SADHS. So um, we cannot say that um, the, you cannot, you cannot make that conclusion that uh, because 12% uh, uh, stopped smoking, 
um, they were supposed to be, you know, more or less because you are comparing two different surveys. This is the very first survey that is comprehensively measuring tobacco use in the country. We can only do another GATT maybe in the next three to five years, and then we can compare if there is a decrease or increase based on that. But if you want to do, uh, if you want to make a comparison with uh, uh, about the years of uh, survey, you can use, for example, this the, this, the uh, SADHS. You can use the SASAS, that is South African Social Attitude Survey. You can check the years. Then you can make such comparison among uh, among the years. But for the GATS, this is what we are finding. This is the very first time we are comprehensively uh, measuring these things, and so we cannot um, draw that conclusion um, using two different surveys with two different methodologies. Thanks so much, Catherine, for, for those responses. Um, just as a reminder to uh, our attendees, we do have a follow-up session tomorrow at 3 p.m. where we'll talk about the policy implications, and so please come with more questions and discussion. Uh, we'll have a lot of time in that session for more engagement. Uh, from my side, thank you for joining us for this session, and thank you to the Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health at UCT for allowing us to use the lecture period for this. Uh, we look forward to um, additional other engagements um, to share uh, sort of groundbreaking uh, research such as this. So with that, uh, over to you, Roger. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, uh, Prof. Sebeko, and a very big thank you to Dr. Nkosi and Dr. Egbe for that um, th those presentations and for the incredible work that you have done in getting the um, GATS um, South Africa survey conducted. Um, a lot, I think a lot of people who are not in the research or um, field do not realize how much uh, work actually goes into conducting a survey. So we, we really thank you for your time today. We look forward to hearing the follow-up session tomorrow at 3 p.m. South African Standard Time. Please make sure that you join us. And for those who are not members of ISAP, um, the International Society of Substance Use Professionals, please feel free to go and um, join the organization um, so that you are um, able to access information sharing sessions like this from around the world. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, just please, as uh, Professor Beck was said, uh, just a reminder about tomorrow's follow-up session in terms of the implications for policy in South Africa. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a great evening further.